All right, let's let's kick off. Hey, everybody, I'm Brian. I'm the founder and CEO of Reforge. Uh, super excited to have uh, Andrew here uh, today. Um, we're going to be talking about reinventing your growth strategy in this uh, roller coaster of a year and tech market that we're having. Um, real quick, if you're unfamiliar with Reforge, uh, we are a membership uh, that um, helps you get the insights of the leading experts in um, in tech. We have an upcoming fall cohort where we run about 20 different programs across products product, uh, marketing, and engineering. All of them have been created and are led by uh, just leading VP and C-level um, experts who have um, helped build some of the fastest growing companies. And so uh, obviously an amazing time um, in the grand scheme of things to be learning and uh, tackling new things. And so we'd love to have you part of that along the way. Um, today, though, we're going to be talking about uh, just this, uh, you know, this really interesting and chaotic market that we're in. Um, I've got Andrew Chen uh, with me along the way. Andrew, why don't you give yourself a quick 30 second intro and, you know, then we'll uh, dive into the dive into the topic. Yeah. Hey, everyone. It's good to be uh, a part of the event. Um, my name is Andrew. I'm a general partner at Andrew Houston Horowitz. Um, I know I'm on a, about a dozen boards or so, including um, things that are part of my current focus, which is metaverse and gaming and, you know, all that good stuff. But then I also spent uh, four years at the firm investing in marketplace companies, consumer companies, et cetera. <clears throat> Brian and I uh, created Reforge together many years ago. Um, and uh, um, and it's, it's awesome to see how, how it's, um, uh, you know, grown. And, and one of the big things for me in this is every single one of my board meetings, every conversation I'm having is about this topic right now. Um, and so it's it's really top of mind. And um, and then also I know for many folks that are in attendance, it's gonna be sort of, okay, well, if the, these things are happening, you know, are being discussed at the board level, how does this actually affect our kind of day-to-day? -day? Um, and I know this is just a, a daily, weekly conversation for folks. So excited to jump in. Yeah, Deb, if uh, I'd be interested in the board meeting you're not having this conversation in, because then I'd be like, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> but uh, but um, just a reminder to folks, uh, there should be a Q&A feature in Zoom that um, you have access to. You can ask questions along the way, and uh, we'll, we'll, ta we'll definitely tackle them um, both along the way and um, uh, at the end uh, as well. But I uh, would lo we'll love to answer questions along the way. Um, all right, Andrew, you published a blog post uh, you published a blog post, I don't know, maybe like a few weeks ago, a month ago now called Reinventing Your Growth Strategy. I was wondering if you could just summarize like the four main points that you were trying to make um, in that blog post and then we can, to give everybody context and then we can dive deep into each one individually. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, I wrote this post because it is, you know, like I said, it's, it is the conversation that, um, that, that we're, we're having in all these, all, you know, board meetings across the industry right now. And then, you know, one level down is if you are, um, you know, in charge of marketing, if you're, um, you know, in charge of your growth efforts, how do, how do all those things kind of like trickle down to, you know, what, what you're going to have to execute over the next couple quarters. And so there's, there's a, there's a couple points that I make, uh, four, four points that I make in the blog post that I want to, um, you know, quickly summarize. The first is really just accepting that this is the new normal, right? Just embracing the new normal. And what that means is for companies that, were originally planning to grow headcount over the next um, you know year. These are these are all companies that are now you know flat, right? These are they're they're not planning to hire very much. For the companies that were planning to be flat already, because maybe you know there's some softness in their business. You know these are the companies that are planning to cut. And if you're planning if you're planning to cut, you know already um, you know before and uh, and then and then now the macro is what it is. Then you know you're going out and you're trying to you know raise that you know, quick round of funding, um, you know, to, 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 you know, with, uh, and then try to get yourself um, um, more time, right? And so, um, and so just accepting that that's where everything is, and this is not something where you can, you know, grow out of it or ignore it or, you know, any of these things is, is, is really key. The second part is really um, uh, thinking through, um, you know, how, how marketing spend is going to, is going to work in this. Um, and, uh, you know, in particular, uh, when it comes to brand and comms and things that aren't highly accountable, um, there's going to be a, a lot of pressure to cut marketing spend and, and to, you know, redistribute e effort and energy from one to the other. And we're going to, we can talk about, um, you know, where that focus all goes. Um, the third thing I talk about in the essay is focusing on engaged high value users. Um, and so rather than trying to get, you know, the next generation of, uh, of lower intent people and focusing on acquisition, a lot of it ends up being just, you know, making sure that you preserve your relationships with the existing users. We'll talk more about that. Um, and then, the, and the, 
you know, fi final point that I make is, you know, in, in the end, like 2022 20, uh, is, is really going to be seen, I think, across the industry as a little bit of a rebuild year where a lot of companies are, um, uh, you know, are not being expect expected to grow 3x or 5x year over year, you know, if you're a series A, series B type company. And instead, the focus is just on living to find another day, right? Um, really, you know, uh, uh, working on, you know, fundamentals, um, getting the business in good order, working on efficiency, um, not really thinking about top line growth rate, and then returning to a growth strategy, um, you know, maybe in 12 or 18 months, depending on what the macro, uh, you know, market looks like. So, um, so yeah, so that, that, that was the essay. And then I know, Brian, we're going to jump into a couple of the points. Yeah, let's talk about embracing the new normal. I think, you know, some of the, the narrative that I see out there or conversations I have are like founders or marketing teams or growth teams. I mean, the industry as a whole kind of feels maybe some whiplash from, you know, like what we were all talking about with the common advice was just right. six or nine months ago, right? From, hey, like we really need to drive really fast growth to compete into this market to obviously the narrative now is more of like an efficiency focus, right? And so I'm just wondering how you think about that that like how, how you think about that whiplash and how you're guiding guiding teams around that yeah well well you know two things on it. i mean one is um you're, you're absolutely right i think their whiplash is a good way to describe it because this is sort of you know 2022 has sort of turned out to be the macro year that um you know we were all warned that the COVID year you know 2020 was going to be right in 2020 we all thought oh my god the economy is going to collapse there's going to be you know, a huge reduction in consumer spending, we're going to be in recession. And instead, we just had this insane bull market. And what, what happens with the bull market is when there's a huge bull market, there's a lot of IPOs, then a lot of the late stage uh, crossover firms, these are guys that invest in both public stocks, as well as in startups, you know, they're, they're, they're busy leading uh, new uh, investment rounds at very high prices. They're putting a lot of money, you know, sort of into pre-IPO companies. And that kind of like, trickles down because that means the venture capitalists like myself feel comfortable investing in, um, you know, high valuations, you know, early stage companies. And then of course, you know, if you're a seed investor, angel investor, um, you're also doing the same. And so there's, you know, dur during, during the, during 2020, we, what we saw was an explosion of new investments, new companies, and this, and this desire, as, as you were saying, you know, Brian, that, you know, I mean, the guidance that we were giving everybody is, Hey, you got to be growing three to five X uh, year over year. And, you know, if, uh, the kind of company that you're in, whether it's a uh, you know like a like a fast delivery you know type company, or if it's in dark kitchens, or it's in something else, if it's high burn and high growth, that's okay. You should do that, right? And so now the the, the in contrast, what's happened is so a similar chain of events as I was describing earlier. You have the public markets down significantly. You know we have a lot of tech stocks, as you guys know, that are down seventy percent, and what that does is. The late stage investors are then pulling back because they're like, wow, if my public portfolio is down 70%, my private portfolio, which only gets updated every once in a while, because it, you know, it, it takes, it's, they're not live traded, obviously, you lead around every 12 months or so, that's probably down. So let's slow down on everything. And there's all these other dynamics with LPs and you know, all this other stuff that we won't get into. But that's sort of been the domino effect that then earlier stage investors all the way down the line are now being a lot more careful. And so what, so, you know, the impact of that means, um, you know, if you are a company that's raised at a valuation of hundreds of millions of dollars, your next round, typically, you know, you're thinking, oh, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, three X all of my metrics, and then I can hit the next round, which is also going to be three X valuation. That's kind of like a good rule of thumb. Every round is sort of two to three X increase in valuation. And so for all of these companies, all of a sudden what's happened is, you're you're now like okay i actually need to step up more than 3x i need that 3x and then also because of the telescoping you know kind of expectation in metrics um i have to do the 3x and then maybe i have to do another 3x on top of that just for just just to make sure that um you know i get there and so um so because of all those reasons folks are just trying to get get more time on the clock um and so from from a growth perspective you know i think what that means is anything that's perceived to be low efficiency um, is is going to get cut. And, you know, one of the things we're seeing, obviously, with some of the layoffs that are happening across the industry is that uh, marketing tends to be one of the areas that's hit the most hardest in terms of budget costs and staffing costs. Uh, but, you know, I think there's just as many over the next couple quarters that are currently going to be, um, you know, where people are just in a hiring freeze. But then depending on how the market is able to, um, you know, fundraise, 
um, over the next few quarters, um, we might see more cuts and we might see more things happen. So, so I think I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm cautiously, you know, uh, observing all, all of these companies and, and trying to monitor the health of the industry. Yeah. I mean, the COVID point is interesting because it's, it, it's like, uh, we kind of had like two whiplashes or there's like a head fake and then, <laughs> and then the, and then the whiplash back. So the last couple of years have been bonkers. Um, I was going to say this question at the end, but maybe I'll, I'll bring it forward since you kind of mentioned it here, which is, uh, you talked a little bit about the next couple of quarters. I'm interested, like overall, like, you know, is your perspective and Dreesen's perspective on like, are we in the first inning of this fifth inning of this ninth? Like, does it even matter? Right. Uh, like trying to predict that in the context of adapting your strategy. How do, how do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, th I think we're I think we're early and you have to plan. You know, I think just to be reasonable about it, I think um, what we've done is we've said, hey, let's plan for all of this uh, to be sort of a, you know, over the next like two years. And in my, you know, kind of at the minimum, it'll probably take something like that to to recover. Um, and so, but, you know, but who knows, right? I mean, who knows? It might recover faster. It might take more time. I think it's very hard to say. And I think, you know, because of that, the industry, you know, and all of us that work in growth and marketing ultimately are, are in a little bit of a defensive crouch because, you know, these are all things that obviously we, we are not able to control yet. Um, you know, it does impact the expectations for the kind of, you know, goal. I mean, I, I think, look, the good news is if you work in the industry, your the 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 goalposts have been lowered significantly right i mean like now now it's like okay if you 2x efficiently that's great you know as opposed to like hey you got to be like you know 3 to 5x now it's like oh if you 2x that's actually you know if you're able to 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 do that really efficiently that that's that's awesome and and everyone will look at you know kind of the companies that that did that over this year as being fine because every ceo will have the ability to say yeah i did not you know being a responsible person, I did not put in a ton of money into a bunch of marketing and growth experiments that, uh, you know, that, that were high risk. Um, and, and I think that will, everyone will be given a flyer for that. So that, that's the good news. And then the bad news is we're going to all have to do this with, um, you know, increased, uh, you know, we got to like walk, watch the marketing costs like a hawk. Right. And, and I think that's the, that, that, that's a trade-off in the new mode that we're in. Yeah, so let's talk a little about that. Your second point in the article was cut marketing spend. And I think one question I've seen a lot um, and somebody asked before, like what, when it comes to trying to figure out how to adapt your growth strategy, there's this line of thinking right now on the marketing side, which is like, okay, macro, macro marketing spend is reducing. That's obvious because you can see that in the reports of Facebook and Snap and, and all that kind of stuff. Therefore, um, won't that lower like CPCs uh, and other kind of top of funnel marketing costs, which then leads teams to, to, to ask this question, which is like, well, should I then be taking advantage of that? Those like lower CPs in time and actually like trying to play offense, right? So yeah. um, in increasing spend. So I'm interested in how you think about uh, like that dynamic in, in that question. Yeah, well, I mean, hard, hard, hard to talk about this in generalities, but I think generally, if you were to say, um, you know, if, if if you really truly are observing that your CAC is is going down, then um, you know, then then of course, like like you know, maybe instead of a twelve month payback period, you might try to target a you know six month payback period or something like that. But if you're able to, and and, and the reason for that, by the way, is you just you you want to uh, conserve capital right now, and so when you when you put a bunch of money, when you spend a bunch of money, and um, you know, in marketing, and you're waiting for that to those cohorts to pay back out you know, you put yourself into uh, potentially a, a, a bigger kind of cash crunch situation if you are on a 12 or, or higher kind of uh, month, you know, payback period. So I think that's that's one aspect, which is you may reduce it and try to get more efficient just because of that. And then if it turns out there's some macro things that are happening, okay, great, then take advantage. I think the, the other thing that is, is uh, um, happening though, which is the counterpoint to all of the, um, you know, kind of CAC trends is obviously the Apple iOS changes, you know, which we've um, uh, all, all spent a lot of time thinking about and talking about. The other big one is honestly just a lot of behavioral changes, um, you know, over the over the last year. It's been very unstable. You know, I'm an investor in a, in a number of companies that are that are focused on, um, you know, food and food delivery and so on. 
and you kind of got a COVID bump, you know, because we're all stuck at home. We all had to order food. And then now it's like, okay, well, you know, is it is it going to grow as fast as it was during COVID um, in a period where now people can go out and, 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 and spend time in restaurants, right? Or if you work on a social app, you have some of the same, you know, aspects. Or if you have, um, if you work in travel, you know, you, you were at a zero and then all of a sudden now everyone's back to traveling, right? So there's a lot of just underlying consumer, um, you know, consumer trends. And we obviously have seen huge gyrations and, you know, the stock prices of, you know, Zoom and Peloton and like all of these things kind of reflecting the market's expectations, uh, you know, changing significantly. So I think, I think it's not, it's, it's hard to predict, uh, you know, kind of in a general sense, like which, which companies CACs are going to go up or down, you know, in that. I, I think I would just say like, you know, in, 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 in reality, um, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to, to uh, have as large of a marketing budget. And so you end up needing to, um, you know, cut the least, uh, the least, you know, uh, uh, accountable part of it. And so that tends to become things like, you know, brand, community, um, uh, you know, long, you know, new experimental, um, you know, projects, maybe, maybe your team has a TikTok you know, project that you've been, you know, the Reforged TikTok project that's been, um, you know, incubating, um, you know, something like that, you know, it needs to put under scrutiny, you know, so I think, I think those, those, those are all the, the, the questions that we have right now. Yeah, I think there was a couple things that I heard in there that I just want to recast a little bit, which is that, um, yeah, like, you know, maybe CPCs and all that stuff are, are going down, but it's really about, you know, the cost of that customer and the value of that customer. And there's other parts of the equation that you need to consider there, right? So, I mean, certainly one thing that I've seen in a bunch of the benchmarking data is that, you know, conversion and conversion to a new customer in categories is, dec is, is decreasing. So even though the costs of traffic are, are decreasing, the cost of the customer is increasing. And then the other part of that is just like the value that the customer is going to generate, which like comes down to retention and, and, that I think is the hardest thing to predict. So even if your CAC is decreasing, are you know are you going to look at back at, in a year and be like, is is that customer just as, you know, do they generate just as much value as right. customers that were acquired a year ago? And that's the game. Like that's like predicting that. I feel like is the hardest uh, yeah. is the hardest part. Um, and is is part of the game, part of the art of like figuring out what you want to do, what yeah. you want to do with your strategy. Well, it, I, I, and I think that I totally agree. And I think the way to reduce that risk is to have a shorter payback window. Right. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of teams, you know, when, as, as, as we all know, when they are busy trying to grow really, really fast, what ends up happening is they really push it to a limit. You know, they get to a point where it's like almost like a, you know, one to one, like, CAC LTV kind of thing, or, you know, not really LTV, but like, you know, whatever, you know, CAC versus a 12, 12, uh, you know, uh, month, uh, you know, payback and, and getting that, that ratio being close to one. And you're like, wow, you're on a knife's edge, you know, in a case like that. And what happens is if you, you know, I think what we're going to see in the industry is for a lot of folks that then pull back and say, oh, wow, actually, you know, the one to one is not going to work because that's a 12 month thing. Let's go to nine months. Let's go to six months is they're going to have to cut spend and actually growth might decelerate a little bit if if the retention isn't there. So I think we're going to we're going to see a lot of products that um you know were were sort of being propped up by uh marketing and acquisition as opposed to having you know deep uh you know product market fit that will will show up I think over the next uh, over the next year. Yeah, I think at the highest level right like the um uh, whether you're on a marketing team or a growth team, product team, um, you know, the, the ultimate thing that the, I think the leadership team is trying to say is just like, look at all the initiatives and bets and there's a cost to those bets and there's a return. The hard part is that the return, there's like some probability assigned with it. Like nothing's a guarantee, right? The cost though is a guarantee. You spend that money, it's like out the door. You hire those people, right? And so... And so it's, it's like, it's playing this right. game of, of, uh, these expected probability bets where the return is uncertain. Um, but the cost is certain. That's right. That's and, right. Well, you know, yeah. I was going to say one of the things that famously we did, um, you know, at Uber kind of in the, in the, in the ad tech space, um, was, uh, at one point the company was spending a lot of money. I think we'd spent like over a hundred million dollars on, um, this one, you know, mobile ad network. And for various reasons, people began to, well, you know, and, and this is where, you know, just so you guys have a scale of this, I mean, you know, sense for the scales, like 
the company was spending a billion dollars a year on referral programs and paid marketing and this and that and that just on the rider side and then there was another billion going on the driver side right so this is to give you a sense of like how crazy the scale was um this is because sort of global global marketing spend on across all channels and one of the things they did was they found this one um you know mobile ad network where they spent i think 100 million bucks and um and then uh and we were unsure of the you know we, we had we had various clues along the way that maybe this you know might might be bots it might be you know whatever and so all we did was we actually did an on off test and just turned off the ad network for a week and then turned it back on and what we found was the actual impact of doing that was like we couldn't tell we couldn't tell and so you're like what do we spend the hundred million dollars you know like whether it's bots or whether it's really low intent or whether it's something it, it didn't move the needle and so i think a lot of the companies that are out there, you know, what, one of the things that you, I, I know everyone can find is that your organic traffic converts the best typically. And so the CAC, and the CAC is zero and that's going to make up the bulk of it. And then the paid marketing kind of sits on top of that and you're getting lower intent folks, uh, but you're getting more volume. And I always encourage every company in, in an efficiency oriented world like this to literally just turn off paid marketing. And just do do that for a week. I mean, it doesn't doesn't hurt anybody. It's not a big deal. Turn it off for a week and figure out whether you know if it's making enough of an impact that you actually want to keep all of it on. And I think in more cases than not, you actually find that um, it doesn't. You know, it's it's low low lower conversion enough that um, you, you you may not be wanting to spend the money. Yeah, I, I mean, so we're talking a lot about. Um, like efficient growth. Um, I guess let me ask the opposite, which is, do you feel like there's any situations or cases, you know, right now where it's oh, where non-efficient growth is okay? And like, what what do you feel like the the characteristics yeah, of the like? situations might be? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I would say two things. I mean, you know, I, you know, I read about this in the essay, which is this is a great time to invest in product led growth, right? This is a great time to go and build your referral program, put that into your app. This is a great time to you know think about sharing flows or multi-user accounts that are going to get users um you know get people get your customers adding you know their 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 friends and their colleagues into the app you know th this is a great time for that and that costs upfront money but it those are the kinds of things you know brian that that are going to pay off in the long run and they're you know pretty much organic um and so i think that's you know that's one flavor of investment that i'm highly supportive of of making and there's ways to you know test that without even writing the code. You can run, you know, you can just do a you know mailing list type experiment and 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 uh, you know try to do a referral code thing and see if that works. Or you can, uh, you know, there's other there's other kind of you know tests that you can do. The second part of it, I would say, is look, you know, the the the, the reality is there's some products um, that they have network effects, and you need a bunch of users at the beginning using the product together in order for it to work. And so you are building a, a product that's targeting colleges. And, um, you know, these, these users are, um, you know, you need, you need dozens, hundreds of users on a campus to use it. I mean, you know, you have to, like, I think of that as almost like that's the, that's the buy-in cost of even activating that network in the first place. And you can't really look at that from a CAC LTV standpoint. It's just like, you know, your anti to even activate the network. And so whether you're talking about that from a, you know, colleges standpoint, or you're doing a, a beta customer list with a bunch of enterprise, you know, small enterprise clients, or um, you're doing, uh, you know, something, um, you know, related to like city launches, if you're doing something that's like kind of a marketplace thing or some kind of vertical category, I think it is really hard to, to, you know, if that's like core to the company strategy, um, I think it's really hard to, um, you know, do that all from a, from a CAC standpoint. That said, you know, if you're already in three markets, if you're already in three universities and you're working on, on the product and you can't grow it efficiently, maybe you shouldn't add the fourth and fifth and sixth, you know, college, you know, in a case like that, or you should be very, you should scale down your expansion plans and figure out how to do it in a more efficient way rather than going and paying a bunch of, you know, a bunch of people to download your app, um, you know, in, in a situation like that. Yeah. Just a reminder of folks, there is a Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, there's a bunch of great questions in there. I uh, would love people to also just look at that and like or upvote the ones that um, are most interesting to them. And that'll give me a good sense of what to answer. Um, yeah, we, can, we, we do a lightning round at the end and cover all the yeah. questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah. And I also just mentioned like a lot of what Andrew's talking about around these initiatives, uh, like how to model these things out and try to get a sense of return and stuff is uh, we teach that in the growth strategy program in, in Reforge. So if that's something you're interested in going really, really deep on, um, we go deeper than you might even want to <laughs> in that program. But um, uh, so I'd love to, uh, before we move to some audience questions, you know, one of your, your closing um, one of your closing points is live to fight another day. And, um, and uh, I've, I've seen some companies talking about what I, I kind of like am calling the stall out, uh, the stall out risk, which is there's this trade off between growth and spend, which is, um, you know, you do have to grow at a certain rate, right, to hit the next round, um, you have to hit some of those, those metrics, but in order to grow, probably need to invest. Um, and then investment can shorten runway. So, you know, getting stuck in this mode of like, well, if I, you know, like if I, if I don't invest, I extend my runway, but I'm not going to hit the growth metrics. But if I do invest, I'm going to shorten my runway and, um, have to raise at a time where, you know, the metrics might not have matured yet. And so, um, like, how do you feel like, I don't know if you're seeing that in some of your conversations or like how to think about the stall out situation. Yeah. Well, I think I think the hardest version would be, hey, I'm gonna have to raise in the next six to twelve months, and should I cut, you know, our growth efforts now? Because if you're if you end up with with completely flat metrics going into a fundraise, you know that that is often you know not a good you know not 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 a good uh, uh, pitch for for investors, right? So so I, I do think that there is a real very practical consideration of you know the characteristics that you need because I think investors ultimately. Um, do need to see growth in order to do it. I think that's why generally everyone's, you know, the, the advice kind of on a on a broader level that I'd give folks is if you're in a situation where you're going to have to raise, um, you know, really soon, then that's where you potentially have to do a riff to extend your runway um, and and figure out how to grow, you know, like not grow now, but grow maybe, you know, get your runway out to a year and then get a couple months of growth on 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 the tail end of that in you know before you go out and, and raise uh but you know that is a really you know tough tough situation um you know for all that just because people are so relatively slow and picky and inactive in the market a lot of investments are still you know a lot of deals are still being done there's a lot of rounds still happening um but you know maybe in the past you uh, instead of being a top 1% opportunity, you could have been like a top 10% and people would fight over that. But now it's like, okay, you really, these have to be like top 1% metrics in order to, you know, and, and team and market and story and everything in order to, um, you know, successfully get that, get that premium step right. And I mean, the other version too, is I think a lot of founders had gotten used to, and we as an industry had gotten used to the idea that like clockwork, you just increase your valuation significantly each time. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and I think we're just going to also see a lot more flat rounds. We're going to see a lot more, um, you know, rounds where the dollar sizes are much smaller. There's going to be a lot more bridge rounds. There's going to be a lot more kind of flavors of all of these things, structured rounds, you know, where there's like, you know, it's a later stage, almost private equity type thing with like downside protection for the investors. There's going to be a lot more things just happening. And I think the way that that ultimately affects growth and marketing teams is um, is that uh, you know on one hand if you have a lot of capital um, and you're in the market now you you potentially could go on offense because all of your competitors will probably be you know cleared out or you know at least hurting and then on the flip side if you yourself you know don't have too much um, you know budget you're going to have to do do a lot more with less. Yeah. So okay. Last question about the article, and then I'll move to some audience questions. Um, you had a quote at the end that kind of uh, hit home for me. Um, the quote was just as product leaders had to reinvent their thinking to take advantage of the mobile boom. Uh, we'll see them do the same in the coming years for the new environment that's rapidly taking shape. Um, the reason this hit home is, uh, I had a startup during that shift to mobile and that shift to mobile, um, led to us like having to sell the company because we got stuck in one of these stall out situations where it was like, uh, we couldn't raise the money to make the investment needed to make the shift to mobile. Um, and I just, that was a huge shift. And so the quote stood out to me and I'm wondering like, do you feel like we are in a similarly sized shift 
right now? Um, and if so, like, how do you, how do you think about that? Yeah. Um, well, I was going to say, uh, you know, first, um, my colleague, Alex Rampel started a company called trial pay that was also in the, like, he actually, the, the, the first quote of this is, you know, can't raise cash without growth, can't grow without raising cash. And this yeah. is sort of this unsolvable problem. I'm going to just put it, I think I can put this into the host and panelists and maybe you guys can figure out how to get it to the, uh, get it to the audience. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, and, and, and the, I think, I think that that, that is certainly, you know, a, a thing, hopefully what this actually is, is this is a, you know, one to three year economic blip and we're back to normal ish, you know, on the other side and versus mobile, I think ended up being, you know, to, to its credit, like, a you know, 10 to 15 year kind of boom and in innovation with a lot of new products. And, you know, I mean, there's, um, even even you know recently, I mean, we're we're investors in a, um, in, in a bunch of uh, you know mobile apps that um, uh, you know that, that are trying to do new things like Clubhouse and, and others, and I think that you know that's a that's a good um, you know th like that that was a, a really long boom that happened a long period of time. This is kind of an economic blip, I think. Um, hopefully, it's not something that lasts you know ten years, but like you never know. Uh, but but I think, do think that what it means is for all of us as you know, that working in the growth and marketing profession, um, you know, what it means is that a lot of the things that we focused on in previous years um, and all, all of those techniques, which are very oriented around, you know, top line growth, all of a sudden need to be converted into, okay, well, you know, like what in a world of efficiency, how do we market that to consumers, right? How do we market that to, to our customers? Um, you know, how do we market it to, uh, uh, you know, how, how does that change the channels, you know, that, that are there? Certain channels like PLG are going to be even more important because of that. Um, and, and maybe, um, you know, the, the, the boom that we've seen in some of the pay channels will, will go down. And again, you know, maybe, maybe some of the Apple changes are, are making that happen anyway. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to start firing through some of these audience questions. Um, uh, Alex um, asked, Alexander asked, uh, I worked at Uber early on growth functions um, in the growth function from promos and experiments was largely part of operations, um, not marketing. What are the pros and cons of having growth teams more focused within a finance uh, marketing or, or op aligned to one of those functions yeah. more closely? Yeah. Yeah. So just, uh, so what's, what was interesting with the way that um, Uber had organized, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the growth and marketing function and as you might imagine, over a ten-year period, every configuration was tried, and so, uh, <laughs> so it's yep. it's uh, it's it, it, you know there's a bunch of different, but but one of the main things was that uh, you know there are city teams that were focused on um, you know individual cities, whether that's San Francisco or um, Jakarta or you know otherwise, and so you had kind of GMs that were responsible for that. They had a number that they were trying to hit, um, you know, each each quarter. Um, or each week, because everyone was was or very oriented, you know, kind of uh, uh, short term on all the stuff. And so as a result, they had a bunch of tools. Like, for example, if you worked on referrals, what would happen is there would be someone in the city that would use your referral tooling that the referrals team would build in order to run referral campaigns. So they would do something like if the holidays were coming up, they would sort of like holidize the you know, referral campaigns. And as a result, you would get like a really cool, like, you know, Christmas version. But, but if you were in like a non-Christian country, then maybe you would get a, you know, you would get a different, you know, holiday promotion. Um, and so I think in that way, the, uh, the, the, the growth team at, at Uber ended up being both a, um, you know, what you normally expect, which is um, building features in the app, but then also building tooling and platforms for all of the various city teams in order to do their work. And you can kind of think about this, like, you know, I'm, you know, Uber is obviously a very specific kind of like offline marketplace type of a thing, but this is the same kind of tension that it can exist in an enterprise context, because if you're part of a central growth team, you're trying to get self-serve to work or, you know, sort of sales assisted to work. And then simultaneously, you're trying to sort of um, land and expand inside of like larger enterprise deals. You also kind of have to think about, okay, like what tools do I build for, you know, our you know, customer success people versus for, um, you know, kind of the broader thing. So I, I think, I think this is like a common configuration that often happens of you needing to sort of balance global and local. And I think it mostly has to do with, you know, from a success standpoint, just what is the, what is the proper configuration 
uh, and like how much resourcing do you have? I think if you are starting out with very little resourcing, you're a startup, then you do, then you're sort of doing global and a lot of your ops and sort of customer account teams are, are doing it, um, you know, kind of like, like they're all the growth things they do are more like sending emails and calling people and this and that. And then, um, and then if you get big, then obviously you can try to handle both. Yeah. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's tackle another one. Uh, just, uh, Henrique, um, asked, uh, you know, mentioned a lot of different levers, um, uh, you answered you you mentioned a lot of different levers like PLG like uh um uh you know UGC SEO referral like ratings and reviews but um it's like you know a lot of teams are running with like small and lean teams right so um obviously hard to tackle them all at once and so just interested in how you think about prioritization yeah. within this this yeah within that yeah yeah what I find is that basically every channel has every product has a set of channels that really uh you know deeply tied to it and it has a lot to do with the underlying customer behavior right like if you work in b2b the reality is is that um you know that the enterprise you know sales is going to be a big co component of what you do um and then also collaboration kind of P base plg in an enterprise environment is going to be key versus if you work in real estate and if you're building like zillow 2.0 redfin 2.0 or something like that then you know your customers are only shopping for car you know for, for houses like you know once every couple of years or something like that and so you're very seo based because that's where the intent is um you know etc so i think i think what you have to do when you are trying to hunt for the right channel is to look at both in the market what has worked that is you know very clearly like what your competitors are doing and figure out if there's an innovation there that you want to do and also look at kind of like adjacent kind of metaphors um, and figure out, is there something that, um, you know, that that you might want to do there? You know, historically travel, for example, has been um, very connected to like, you know, OTAs like the booking.coms and Expedia.coms, et cetera. Um, but, you know, there's always been kind of this dream of like, well, what if you built something that was like very, you know, sort of visual and Instagrammable and more inspirational and like you could take you know, sort of inspiration from social apps like that and try to build a new, uh, you know, product and channel. And then that might go through viral growth and sharing and so on. And so anyway, those, these, these are some of the questions that you might ask yourself, um, you know, within it, but it's, it tends to be very product specific. Yeah. I would just mention too, is that I think um, is a lot of, I see a lot of teams kind of get the idea of experimentation and testing wrong. And, and it's kind of the, are you an explore versus exploit mode, which is the idea of testing a bunch of things is not to find a lot of things that works. It's to kind of find the high leverage, the thing that has the high ceiling and then like really focus in um, on that. And so I think a lot of small teams kind of get that, get that wrong a lot, which is, um, which is like, yeah, there's a lot of these ideas. Let's go test and figure them all out. But it's not like you're going to try to keep all those plates spinning in the air constantly. It's really to find the plate that you really want to hammer, you know, hammer home and, and dive in on. Um, all right. Uh, one lever we have not talked about is pricing and packaging. Um, and Marshall asked a good question. Like, how do you think about pricing in this environment? One hand, customers are more price sensitive, so maybe a lower price point helps you grow, but that strategy could also do damage in the long term, train customers to buy at a lower price point and uh, lower your brand value. So um, interested in how you think about that lever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's uh, uh, typically when you're when you're lowering prices, what you're going to get is you're going to get it's going to grow your top line because you're going to be able to address part of the TAM you know, for your product that uh, previously, um, you know, found the price to be, to be, uh, you know, too high. And, and typically what that's going to get you is that's actually going to get you a lower, uh, lower intent customer. Um, and, 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 and that has all sorts of, you know, uh, benefits and, you know, uh, downsides, right? I mean, the benefit is if you can grow your TAM, you can get more people. If your product has some kind of a network effect, that can be good. Right. So if you are going to do this in, in a bottoms up kind of SaaS collaboration tools kind of contacts like the Slacks and the Saunas of the world, um, you know, be going, going all the way to, to freemium, you know, might be might be the right um, you know, way to, to go about it. On the flip side, what's happening when you do that is you're typically, you know, by getting that lower intent customer, you're also um, in, in a state where their, their overall LTV is probably going to be lower and they're more likely to churn. You know, that's, that's usually what I see, you know, in, in all of that. And so the reverse move, which is raising prices, 
often allows you, you know, cause like if you, if you kind of think about um, your overall customer base, you know, depending on your product, right. But there's often products where, um, you know, like a lot of what the most common pattern I see is actually startups typically undercharge uh, their customers. Um, and there's usually a small grouping of it kind of, again, typically a little bit more enterprisey where they would pay even more because it solves an even bigger problem and they have even more budgets. And so as a result, Oftentimes raising prices actually gives you more flexibility because raising prices then gives you a higher LTV, which then unlocks, uh, you know, more channels because you can accommodate a wider range of CACs. So that's, that's kind of the strategic like trade-off that you're, you're trying to, you know, make, make between the two, but yeah, Brian, I'm curious it, if you have. It's oh, well, I mean, it's definitely a game. I mean, I think, I think the other thing I would just add to this is um, in Pricing and packaging is so complicated because uh, a change affects every single part of your business, typically. Um, how you market the product you build around that price point, um, um, how you support it, you know, if you have a sales team, like all these types of things. And so uh, it, I think people underestimate uh, the, comp, like the down, the second and third order effects of, of these types of of changes just across the organization. But I would also add is like, I see a lot, we've had a lot of questions inside Briefforge programs around mid-market and enterprise companies that have more of like a, a sales motion wanting to, you know, develop a product-led growth motion. And, um, and you know, that's what I, that's what we did at HubSpot. You know, that's what I was hired for them to do. They had a very like sales and marketing driven motion. And one of the bets that they wanted to make was to develop a more product-led growth motion. But that was like a like three year journey just to to like really figure out the the I'll put all the pieces together the product that was going to work you know to drive the product led motion um, you know the sales that tied into it uh, um, how that was all augmented with marketing and support and all that and then there was like another like multi year journey after I left which was uh, led by Michael Peachy on how to like scale that and so. I think that um, one of the things you just have to think about in these investments is is it's it's usually not you usually just can't change one lever like drop a price. You have to like think about them all. It's like, well, I'm going to drop a price, but what is the product experience for this? How do I make this self serve? Right? Uh, how do I build that muscle? Do I have the right people inside the company to 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 build that? Right? Like, there's just there's a lot of components that go right, and these things typically, especially if you're in a larger company. These things take time. Um, uh, def definitely take time to to tackle. So, um, uh, all right, uh, let's let's tackle another one here. Um, you know, I move to like more of a little bit of an investing question. But Sandy asked, like, if VC's investment horizon is five or ten years, uh, then why worry so much about you know kind of this season that we're in? Um, wouldn't you rather accelerate investments now? Yeah. Uh, at, you know, in, in this season? Yeah, um, th that is such a good question. And um, I think that there's, let me give you the point and the counterpoint on it. So the, 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 the general point has been that um, almost all the companies that are in the market today are, have, have uh, uh, you know, are, are burning money, you know, as, uh, you know, they're, they're in an investment phase. And so because of that, they're burning money with the anticipation that every time they raise, they will raise another round kind of in two to three years. And so you design your entire financial plan off of that. And so what happens is you go raise $20 million and you say, okay, well, I'm going to be negative $1 million uh, a month. And what that means is at the end of, you know, spending that money, there's got to be another investor who then puts in more money. Um, and so because of that, you're kind of in a world where the seed investor believes that the A is going to happen, the B is going to happen, the C is going to happen, and the D is going to, you know, the pre-IPO rounds are going to happen, and then you're going to be able to go public. Then each round basically has has to believe that all the future rounds all are going to happen as well. And so, you know, the challenge is like, even if your fund is designed on a 10-year basis, if it takes, you know, a great example of this is like space tech and deep tech, you know, the reason why historically it's been so hard to get those funded and why you need somebody who's from outside the industry like Elon Musk is because you sort of need a team that can raise potentially three or four more rounds um, with no traction data, you know, they're just on story. And so because of that, even if you're the seed investor and you're like, I'm in it for the long haul, the challenge becomes you're kind of like, okay, well, how do I get people to believe in this, um, but keep successively raising at higher prices and more, more money. 
Now, now the counterpoint to, you know, to, to your question, which I think is a really good one, is that if you had had this view and tried to sit out the market in 2000, you know, 8, 2009, 2010, et cetera, you would have also missed, you know, Coinbase and Airbnb and Pinterest and, you know, Stripe and a number of really fantastic companies because of the fact that, you know, the other thing that is happening is the best founders in the market, what we find is they just like, do not give a fuck about like the overall thing. Like if they're excited about starting a company, they just go do it. And, um, and what you're getting is you're getting a higher intent founder, um, you know, during some of these macro, you know, kind of these downturns. And then you're also getting a softer labor force, meaning a startup doesn't have to compete with, um, you know, fan companies paying extremely high premiums um, on every candidate, which would, has been the case over the last 10 years. And so, um, so I think all, all of those things make it also, you know, potentially when the market is soft, as long as you're a founder that's able to raise money and make progress uh, with, with uh, you know, reasonable round sizes, um, it can also be very accommodating of a time to, to, to start a company. So the, the, those, that's sort of the trade-off, you know, either way. Um, all right. A question around a topic that I know is near and dear to your heart network effects, uh, but uh, <laughs> um, Harsha asked, do you think uh, these downturns, upturns, uh, upturns um, can result in anti-network effects in any unanticipated ways? And how do you like spot if your network effect is is breaking? Yeah. Well, I think there's, uh, uh, and, and the second part of the question is like, is, is nuanced and really interesting. And so, and I, and I didn't actually have time to really dig into it in my book. So I'll, I'll kind of give a uh, answer on both. So I think the fir first off, the answer is yes. I think the challenge is that when you are building a, um, you know, network effects business, you're often doing various things in order to make sure that your network continues to grow over time. Right. And so in a B2B context, you know, if you're building, if you're selling collaboration tools into all of these enterprises, okay, well, what's going to happen when the budgets are cut, right? What's going to happen when, um, you know, are you still going to be able to grow your licenses and your seats within these companies when, um, you know, when, when, when your customer base is, is themselves not growing, right? So I think that's, that's the kind of factors on the B2B side, I think, you know, that, that you'll start to see, um, you know, softness there. And, um, and, and so that's one challenge, you know, on the consumer side, it's a little bit more complicated. I would say like generally consumers kind of, depending on the macro, they may or may not act the way that you think they will. Um, and, and so, um, and so, you know, the, 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 the main thing I would point out is in a lot of cases, network effects are sustained by adding a lot of new users. And so if, if your base is not growing because you're not putting in the marketing cost in order to continue growing the network, right? Like if you're building a dating app and your dating app is basically starting to get stale, the network, you know, you're, everyone's starting to see all the same people, then, you know, what does that do? Okay. Well then, then that, that might create a problem because um, engagement will eventually go down. Um, and then in terms of like how to detect network effects, um, you know, and whether or not you're, you're, you're being hurt by them. I think the big thing just generally is, uh, you know, it's the same answer to like, how do you tell the effect of network effects in, in, in the first place? And the big thing is um, it, when, when you take your product and let's say you're in, you know, you're in, uh, you're building, you know, like collaboration tools and you have like 20 customers or something like that. I think the big thing you can look at across the 20 customers is don't look at your top line number, but to look at, to break your network into the subsequent sub networks. And so you have your 20 sub networks. And you basically say, okay, well, how's the engagement going across each of those subnetworks? And how does that relate to the active users within those subnetworks? And so if you start to see, even though my you know, overall mile seems to be flat or maybe it's even growing, but you have a couple where the companies have you know, cut costs, cut, cut budgets, and as a result, your MAU is going down and your engagement is going down. Okay, that's when you that's when you 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 should be worried about those ones. And so I think ultimately, um, you know, it's all about digging into the the sub networks as opposed to looking at your kind of vanity metrics at the highest level. Um, similar question um, for Michael, but but slightly different, uh, which was a little bit more targeted at at me. So I'll, I'll take a shot at it first, and then see if Andrew yeah, has to add. Um, My, Michael asked, uh, how much of the four fits model, uh, do you still apply today uh, versus when I create it and, and how might it be um, 
um, different in this environment. And so what Michael's referring to is um, I've got a series of blog posts called The Four Fits. Uh, what it refers to is I think everybody's familiar with product market fit. Um, but to like really get the company cranking, there's actually a few other things you need to align. It's kind of like putting a puzzle together. Um, so there's like product channel fit, which is really about uh, how your product is built to tap into a specific channel, um, uh, like SEO or paid or something like that. There's channel market, uh, uh, there's channel model fit, your monetization model, which is um, uh, aligning your monetization model, your pricing, your packaging with the channels you're using there, which is uh, obviously um, lower price, lower friction monetization models align well with lower lower friction, lower intent channels like SEO, um, things like that. And of course, the higher you are priced, the more influence you need to get somebody to, uh, to buy your product. And so that's where like sales and stuff comes in. And finally, um, um, uh, model market fit, which is more about um, how your pricing aligns to uh, your target audience. And so I, um, to answer your first question, Michael, I still definitely use it. Uh, um, I use it every single day as thinking about Reforge and, and we teach a lot of it in the Reforge programs and go deeper on it. I think the interesting thing related to this conversation is that one or more of those fits can break in this environment, um, like things that you might've had previously. And so in, in the, in the context of like product market fit is that, um, you could definitely be in, you could be in a category where, it breaks. You could also be in a category where it like creates fit. And so I'll give an example of the the latter one first, which is something like um, a company like Vendor, which is literally their value prop is you sign up with us, you pay us, I don't know, I'm making up like $20,000 a year, and we're going to save you $40,000 by collectively bargaining and negotiating all of your SaaS tool, uh, SaaS tool fee fees, right? So th obviously a value prop like that in this market <laughs> you know, maybe not be a high priority in like the former market, but in this market is like, boom, like you've got, you've got an instant tailwind, instant fit with a much larger, much more adjacent um, audience. Right. But it can also happen in the reverse. Right. And um, similarly, like product channel fit, you know, Andrew was mentioning a bunch of these things that uh, like the iOS changes, all, all of these other things. And that's not necessarily related to the macro market shift. They're just happening at the same time. But those things or Google's update, which we're still waiting to see what the actual effect is, right, could easily break um, um, that fit as well. And that's something like you need to, to realign um, along the way. And so anyways, when we experience these like huge shift, these whiplashes like in the market, it's not uncommon for one or more of these things to either snap into place or fundamentally break, uh, depending on like where your, where your company is at. Andrew, anything to add to that? All right, let's tackle. Uh, let's tackle a couple more. We got like six minutes left, so maybe we go through some quick ones. Uh, um, all right, somebody asked, which trend would you put your money on in the current environment? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I'm, 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 I'm definitely uh, voting with my feet here, and um, you know, uh, very recently uh, moved over to uh, work on uh, A16Z's Games Fund One. Which is you know our new our new uh, uh, team that is um, investing in gaming and the metaverse and avatars and Web three and all this all this kind of good stuff and so um, a, a lot of that had been uh, just you know the observation that um, you know after fifteen years in the industry you know doing kind of mobile and you know quote unquote Web two point you know kind of stuff that a lot of the consumer attention and engagement has actually shifted to. Um, things like mine, Minecraft and Roblox and Fortnite and um, and you know I'm I'm just thinking about my own kind of interests and and uh, you know where I want to go and and decided to you know head head in this direction um, and so uh, and and it's an industry that actually you know does have um, you know the mobile side of the industry is very sophisticated with um, with uh, uh, you know paid marketing based uh, user acquisition but um, you know the sort of like uh, PC console, you know, world is very much based on organic and it's very much based on kind of multiplayer. They're kind of like next gen social networks, um, which is exciting. So I'm, I'm, I'm spending my time there. Um, if I weren't in this space, I think the other, you know, big one obviously would be like looking at Web3 kind of more broadly. I think that's very interesting. The other big um, area that I think is uh, interesting, it's not really an area, but just kind of more, more broadly would be like spending time uh, looking at developing markets um, and kind of, you know, now that, now that uh, whether you're, you're talking Africa, LATAM, Southeast Asia, 
Um, there's a tremendous amount of smartphone adoption, tremendous amount of technology adoption more generally. And what that's led to is a bunch of very successful companies in um, you know, fintech and in delivery, but then I think they're sort of concentric circles out. They have very different needs than um, kind of the Western market. And so that's a good example of kind of another area that, that I'd be interested in. Yeah. All right. Evelyn Chu asked, uh, what's considered a healthy run rate for early stage right now? So we'll go like seed series A. Yeah, I think um, uh, I think it's less about the run rate and it's more about the, you know, the, the growth rate and the efficiency of the growth rate. I think, you know, if you're in um, if you're ultimately if you are in B2B, um, you know, and you're and you want your series A done, you know, you still have to show your 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 at let's say a million bucks ARR, or you have a path to get there kind of in the near future or something like that, you know, sort of ideal. Obviously, if you have a superstar team that's come out of, you know, Slack or something like that, then maybe you can raise in Series A, you know, without that. Um, and so th those are those are some of the things that you might you might play, pay attention to, you know, versus you look at something like Be Real on the consumer side, and uh, there's no there's no, you know, business model embedded within the app, but the growth rate is so tremendous. They've gone from zero to you know, 10 million DAUs in nine months or something like that. And, you know, in, in a case for something like Be Real, um, uh, you know, the, the, the revenue thing isn't even a thing. You know, they're like the folks that are that are excited about it are really back in because of the consumer usage and engagement. And so um, it, it sort of kind of gets into the broader question of like, how do investors kind of evaluate companies? Um, but I think I think the answer to that is like many, many different ways. Um, and so there's not there's not one fits one size fits all kind of revenue answer for all this. All right, last question. It was the most popular question. I see a bunch of other questions around like product led growth. Uh, um, uh, Landon asked just any rec uh, recommended um, reading, listening for product led growth. Um, I'll give my quick take uh, with obviously a little bias, but um, uh, we go really deep on product led growth in Reforge. Um, we just don't necessarily call it that growth series, growth strategy, product strategy. We all, we like, we, in all these programs, we go deep on it, but I would say go to the source, like, uh, follow the people who have done it before. Elena Verna, Adam Fishman, Andrew, um, uh, um, Bengali Kaba. There's, there's a bunch of these folks. Uh, that um, have actually done it before. They they publish on Twitter and LinkedIn occasionally. Um, go there. Uh, I think sometimes there's a lot of people out there that are like aggregating their thoughts, but you end up in like a game of telephone where things kind of get watered down and lo lose the nuance. And so I, I my preference is always to go straight to the source. And that's what I recommend when people yeah. read this. But Andrew, I'm wondering if you have any other names that are on your Yeah, list I, I was well. just going to say, I think PLG is kind of funny because it's kind of like an enterprise B2B name for like what the consumer where people have been doing like forever, right? It's like the whole point yeah. of like consumer products yeah. is you need the product to be actually like beautiful and like really easily to use and like spread on its own. And like, you know, that's been like, you know, the story of like Instagram and Twitch and, you know, all these other things. And I think the sort of, you know, it seems like PLG sort of has evolved from the more awkward, like consumer -y, you know, like SaaS, like kind of keyword or, you know, whatever, right. That people have been using, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think I, I generally agree with, you know, um, you know, Brian's take, there has not been a lot that has been written about, down about it. I think there is a lot within the Reforge content because ultimately the, the core of PLG is about, um, you know, how do you use your product to build these growth loops so that they spread on their own? And why is it that the product is so useful that you end up, you know, wanting to use it with, with all of your, your colleagues and so on. And then the other thing I would encourage folks that are in B2B to do is to talk to their peers on the consumer side, because I think in a lot of cases, you know, where, where those lessons and where these things are being learned is by arbitraging the two disciplines. You know, there's a lot of folks yeah. that end up basically working in the enterprise track and they work in a series of, you know, kind of like teams within Microsoft or something, let's say, uh, but they never actually get the chance to work on a fast growing consumer app. Um, and so as a result, that sort of, you know, is that way versus I skew very consumer in, you know, what I do and I'll occasionally work and consult with folks at, you know, Dropbox and, you know, other, other places. Um, but in general, uh, you know, the, 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 the two sides of the world probably should talk to each other more. Yeah. I like that uh, discipline arbitrage. All right, we need to wrap up here. Like I mentioned, um, if you want to go really deep on these topics, join Reforge as a member. We have an upcoming cohort uh, programs across product marketing and engineering. We go through super detailed 
examples, step-by-steps, uh, frameworks to tackle these big topics like product strategy, like growth strategy. And um, it's all from the folks who have done it before many, many times. So uh, we'd love for you to join us all. Andrew, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts in uh, this roller coaster of a time. Good luck to thank everybody for, for yeah, for all of you riding the roller coaster. Everybody hold on tight. This is an interesting time to be in tech and uh, we hope everybody uh, does well. All right. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Andrew.